I'd like to welcome everybody today to our Integrating Bioinformatics Education Series. I'm Dr. Liz Pierce and I'm the, the moderator. Today I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. April Benarski. She is a curriculum specialist and instructor for the undergraduate biology program at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research interests are in creating authentic course-based research experiences for undergraduates. Uh, today, she's going to be talking to us about some of her curriculum projects uh, for freshmen and sophomore students that use bioinformatics tools uh, to illustrate principles of central dogma and use of model organisms. She will also be describing a course-based research experience that builds on that knowledge in junior and senior years to provide opportunities for students ask their own research questions, develop hypotheses, and design exper experiments. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Dr. April Benarski. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you this afternoon. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm happy to be able to speak in this seminar series. Um, so I come to the subject of bioinformatics from someone who uses these tools to better understand protein structure and function. So I do not have a computer science background. Um, or and I don't work with large data sets. I've been working as a curriculum specialist in the department to design curriculum to help uh, design for students to do that's hands-on to better make the connection between genotype and phenotype. So that's and that's one of the big goals of our introductory curriculum. So in my talk today, I'm going to be describing curriculum that falls into different places on this spectrum from learning about research to doing research. Um, and I should also say, please interrupt any time if you have questions and want to um, want me to lab on anything. So in this, um, in this spectrum, on the learning about research would be a typical lecture course, and then the labs that can go along with those that are directed and just step-by-step -step doing um, an experiment that has the, the steps written out for the students. Then um, we would put the uh, literature or seminar course uh, steer, still near the learning about research part of the spectrum, where the other part of the spectrum is on um, research and, um, and having an individual research project. So like for undergraduates, that might be a summer research experience. The first uh, class, I'm, or one of the classes I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'm, I'll be referring it to as Bio 2960, but it is our introductory biology course. That's a large lecture course, and it does have a directed lab that goes with it. And then we have um, a computer-based investigative lab that, that we, I'll call Bio 3055. And so that's a little bit farther along the spectrum where students do have some investigation where they don't have a known outcome. And then I'll also be talking about a course-based research experience, enzyme analysis, where students will be using bioinformatics tools and computational tools to study protein structure and function. So I'm actually going to talk about these out of order, though. So um, the 3055 course I'm going to talk about first, and this is the course that is has a, a little bit more of an investigatory component to it. It's a computer-based laboratory that we designed for sophomores to use bioinformatics tools and really can make that connection between genotype and phenotype. But to have, some, to have it feel more exploratory, like they're kind of walking along an investigation. And then I'll um, elaborate more on the kinds of experiments that we have students do in that introductory biology course. And then finally, I'll talk about that, my um, junior, senior course, um, enzyme analysis. So in our introductory sequence, we used to have um, a, a three-semester sequence. So we would start with cell biology and introductory biochemistry, and that came with a wet lab. Um, the second semester was a genetics course, and the third semester was a combination between biochemistry and physiology that had just a computer-based lab, and that's the course that I'm going to be talking about today. The new sequence that we have in the last five years, um, we have incorporated the computer component from this course into um, mostly the 2960 
lab. So we've added some computer components to this wet lab that accompanies the first semester, and students take this the, in their freshman year. So the biochemistry and physiology components are now just upper level courses that students take at, at different times. And it's not considered part of our introductory sequence anymore. So the goals of designing the computer-based investigation for students in this introductory sequence was to introduce students to some commonly used web-based tools that they might uh, encounter in their research, summer research experiences, doing research with faculty on the medical campus or um, at, a, at another institution that they might go to over the summer. So this was a large course, about 270 students. And then the lab or the course, we divided into lab sections of 20 students each. And we designed 10 projects that could be used over and over again, but um, 10 projects per lab section. So I'll describe that a little bit more in the, on the next page. But we also had a goal of wanting to provide a small group learning experience within this large lecture course format. Um, so this slide, I mainly wanted to focus on how we have the labs set up with the computers and around the out edge of the class and the instructor in the middle. This was a really useful way to teach the class so that we could see what the students were doing on their screens and just and standing in one spot. We still did a lot of running around uh, as students have questions, but it helps us see who is who's stuck, even if they didn't have their hand up. So we had 20 computers. Each student has a computer, even though they will be working with a partner on the project. They will each be going through the steps themselves as well. And I'll be talking more about how the weeks were divided up, but we had five weeks to the course with two hours a week, um, so only 10 hours total. So it was a pretty quick uh, ex experience for them. They did do some, some out of class time, but most of the research, most of their project was done in class. We designed a website that, that was kind of the, the home base for the students during the course. So they could come here for all of their links to the different tools they would need. And then I'll be um, scrolling down on this page to the projects on the next site. This, these tools are all still available on the website I have posted up here at the top, um, the, the Bio 3055. It's not password protected. There are um, lab manuals and, um, and journal, um, just the journal article citations at the site. And then also a mutant sequence, which was their starting point of their research. Every project started with a, a mutant gene sequence. That was a, a human gene. So the projects were divided up, um, 10 projects, and they were divided up into five groups so that there were two projects per disease. And so, for example, project one is KRAS, um, about the, the RAS protein and um, a P450 enzyme. And both uh, mutations in both of these proteins had been linked to lung cancer. So students that were working on either of these projects would read a background article um, in the scientific, uh, in it was a Scientific American article, so very accessible, that talked about the genetic basis for lung cancer risk. And these, these two groups would read the same background reading, then, um, even though the projects were different. Um, so that was the same for all of these groups. They would have some similar background reading, but then their, the protein that they studied was, was, um, was one of those two. Uh, and then they're going to um, pr be presenting to each other at the last section. So in the first week of the class, I don't have a slide for this, but it was basically a tutorial that walked students through some of these tools so that they would feel a little bit more confident when they started on their project. And everybody um, in the first week of class was working on the same uh, protein, cyclooxygenase, the, the target for aspirin. And um, we were using that as our, as our model. Then week two, they started in on the project and they were given this um, mutant sequence. They were just, uh, that they would download that from our course website. And this mutation was a change, um, um, a polymorphism found in the, uh, and they could, there were patients that have been identified that had this, this change that led to an amino acid change at this position. So all of the projects had this, um, 
this medical component. And they would um, use the NCBI gene database to download the RefSeq for or the that we were calling the wild type sequence for this gene. And they would uh, translate the mutant sequence and then align it um, along with some other proteins they found from doing a fast search to find identify homologous sequences. And we use clustal omega to make the alignment. And then we had students work with this alignment a little bit to um, to annotate it so they would print this out and then write on it themselves so that they could first identify the amino acid change between their mutant sequence and the wild type. Um, so for this example it's a glutamate 286 to lysine and then they would also identify um, figure out what these sent at the bottom that were part of the clustal omega output and see the asterisk is for identical positions and then they would have to um, figure out what the double dots or a blank meant for that position in the alignment and relate this back to the amino acid side chains. This fit really well with the lecture because they were learning about amino acid side chains and the different chemistry at this time. So they could use that, that knowledge here. And then they also would map secondary structure predictions on top of the alignment. So in this case, they were, um, we used Cypred at the time, but I think there are some, some other, uh, maybe JPred, had three we could use in the future. Um, so we would align, uh, have students draw on top of the alignment the secondary structure predictions at, in the alignment. So this helped them lead into week three where, the, where they work with the tertiary structure of the protein. So the week three and part of the, the project, they would um, work with the crystal structure. So we um, would get the PDB file from um, from the RCSC database. And then they would work with that PDB file in one of these programs. We, we switched, um, we've switched off different PDB structure viewing programs over the years, but um, we currently use PyMole as our main program because so many courses use PyMole that it seemed like a good one for students to get to, to get familiar with. In the chemistry department, there were several course, there are several courses that use PyMole. And in the biology department, we have at least four or five courses that also, also introduce students to PyMol. So it makes sense for us to, to use this one. I do have directions for STAR Biochem, which is a great program um, from MIT that doesn't require any command lines for students to learn um, that PyMol does. And so there are, that website I had before, I also have directions for each project for using STAR Biochem to view the protein structure. The goal of this part of the investigation was for them to develop a hypothesis for what they think could happen uh, structurally when this amino acid mutation is made. So they would also read the crystal structure article, which was based on the wild type protein. So it doesn't always have a lot of. It's sometimes some we were some projects we were able to find articles that talked about that particular amino acid, but some we didn't. So some they're really just learning about the wild type protein and then trying to figure out um, on their own, um, make a guess about what that amino acid side chain could be doing. They would um, zoom in and look at the side chain interaction with the substrate closer so that they could help um, develop that hypothesis. And in this picture, I'm showing the wild type glutamate side chain and how it might be hydrogen bonding with the substrate based on distance measurements. And then the students would model the lysine mutation in the using the crystal structure, a really low level type of fitting model that or not even fitting. Um, it, it really was just a picture uh, in this for this lab. They would just um, uh, choose this amino acid side chain to help them come up with ideas. So it was really just a, a way of helping the students think about what might happen. So here with this close distance, they might imagine some steric hindrance and charge repulsion that could uh, affect our substrate binding. So this BH4 might not even bind when this, um, in this mutant protein. Then week four, they're trying to integrate that structural knowledge with the overall um, pathway and what might be leading to the symptoms or the disease state. So they would use the OMIM database, which um, was maintained um, at Johns Hopkins at one time, and then now it's, I think, at um, NCBI still. Um, 
or you can access it through the NCBI site. And this is an annotated database that summarizes research articles about different genetic diseases. So you can make the link to gene involved. And all of the projects that students were reading about had an entry in the own database. So they were chosen for that reason. And there was a patient that had the mutation they were studying. So they could read about the symptoms of um, from that patient. You would also go to the CAG database, which is the database of pathways and look up their protein. So in this example, this is phenylalanine hydroxylase that is in this red box here. And all of the proteins they can, all of the boxes are proteins they can click on and read about an entry about that protein. And then the nodes are small molecules. So they can click on those and read about that metabolite. So for phenylalanine hydroxylase, when this enzyme is um, not functional, phenylalanine builds up to toxic levels and causes ketonuria and um, that um, one of the main symptoms is um, it's a neuro, um, can cause neurological problems but this can be avoided by diet so it, um, students are usually familiar with the, this and um, and could easily understand that that connection between the pathway function and the, the disease state then they would write a one-page summary of all of their findings kind of integrating all of their knowledge that they could present to each other in small groups during week five. So week five, it was a really informal presentation where they just were turning their chairs towards each other and talking to each other. But like the two people who were working on KRAS could present to the two people working on um, the P450 enzyme. So they read background articles about genetic links to lung cancer risk. So they had that in common and kind of came in with some common knowledge and then talked to each other. Um, just, um, we have some, some survey and pre-post test data about um, the student experience in this course, but just from my observations, this week I was really critical. They often hadn't integrated the knowledge until they had to try to present it to each other. That provided some important incentive to bring it all together. And I think up until this point, it was very fragmented. They they did some sequence analysis, but they hadn't really connected it all to what the sequence had to do with the structure, which had to do with the, the um, pathways and influencing the pathway and the disease state. So this was really an exciting day to help them to listen to them. And then they um, often gave feedback of like, oh, I get it now. I understand why we were doing this and how it all linked together. And I just kept hearing that over and over again. They hadn't gotten it before now, but, but at least many of them did by this last day. So, um, so that was exciting. And I think and, and obviously an important part of the curriculum that um, that presentation part, even even it being very informal. Okay, um, so now I'm going to um, switch gears and talk about how we've integrated some of that lab into our principles of biology one course. So we're um, working with students at an earlier stage here, where they're just this is their first course in biology in the department, and we still have that central dogma theme going in this course that we're trying to help students connect genotype to phenotype. And we also would like to help students um, use, integrate the, anal anal or the using the web-based bioinformatics tools in that analysis with wet lab in a wet lab exper experiment. So we have a couple different ways that we do that in this, in this course. So these are the three points I'm going to talk about. Um, we we do we do some other analysis, and, but the, these are the main ones I wanted to talk about. So this PKU lab, the same lab. Oh, sorry, I'm echoing um, from 3055. Just talked about, and then the yeast cloning experiment and the 16S ribosomal RNA experiment are places where we connect um, lab with some data, some sequence analysis. So first I'm going to talk about the PKU lab and how we now do this um, in, with students in a more independent way. 
So one thing we found with the way we had been doing it in 3055 was that giving students that set of instructions to get through the analysis, they were really just pointing and clicking where we told them to and not um, thinking a lot about what they were doing and having to do a lot of troubleshooting on their own. And we changed that so that students do more outside of lab on their own with fewer directions. Um, but we've also simplified the project a little bit. So they are going to all be analyzing the same protein. So we have everybody analyzing phenylalanine hydroxylase. And we talk about um, PKU and the connection between phenylalanine hydroxylase and, um, and, and phenylketone. And then we can also make this connection. Students, even if they don't drink Diet Coke, they can look at the label and see this. Um, this alert to phenylketonurics that they need to avoid aspartame um, because there's a phenylalanine as part of the molecular structure of aspartame. So they can't, um, phenylketonurics shouldn't drink um, Diet Coke, for example. So this kind of um, introduces them to the, the ideas and the, the gene disease connection. And then students do the analysis outside of lab. So they are um, told to go to NCBI and get the RefSeq for um, the alanine hydroxylase. We give them the mutant sequence at a, at a website that they can use connected to lab. And then they align the sequences to identify the nucleic acid change. Um, they also translate the um, nucleic acid sequence using XBASE. And they, um, this is an example of what the output looks like for them. So in this choosing the correct reading frame, they have to remember that sequences start with um, a methionine, and then they're looking for the largest open reading frame. So for this one, they would obviously choose frame two and um, copy and paste this protein sequence for using in an alignment later on. So um, that was all part one of the lab. Um, and then, oh no, actually, I mislabeled that. They do all of the protein work in part two. So this should be all part two. So in part two of the lab, they work with the protein sequence and they um, make an alignment to identify the amino acid change. And then finally, they read about the amino acid change in a crystal structure article. So this is an example where we did find an article and a crystal structure that models the patient. So students aren't um, developing a hypothesis as much as reading about um, what the structural effects are of that mutation for their, the final part of that experiment. So this is all done outside of lab, but we introduced it to them in person. And then, um, and then they turn everything into us and ask us questions and things. Um, but they are meant to do this on their own. Okay, then um, the two, there, this is one of the two wet lab experiments that we have the sequence analysis component. So the 16S RNA experiment, they are identifying an unknown bacteria. We start with, six, with 18 unknown bacteria culture tubes um, uh, that students, um, different pairs have different unknowns. And then they amplify using PCR a region of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. It's a very a variable region of the gene. And sequence that gene. Um, they week three, they get the sequence back and they analyze the DNA and use um, NCBI blast to identify the unknown um, bacteria. So the benefit of doing this is this is a really common way of identifying. Um, unknown bacteria, and there are there's a lot known about this gene sequence for different um, bacteria. The 16S ribosomal RNA gene has regions of conservation and high variability. So we can design primers that align to the conserved regions that amplify the variable regions of the gene. And then in NCBI, we can choose under their BLAST uh, program. There's a choice for 16S ribosomal RNA sequences that they can use when they're um, performing the BLAST search. And then the organism names that they get back, they can match to our unknown list. So they usually get pretty close. We um, can match the, the genus and not always the species, but, um, but usually both with this analysis. 
The third integration of the wet lab computer component for this introductory course is a cloning experiment. So this um, helps students understand how genome libraries are made. So we take, uh, we give them um, a, a randomly cleaved uh, fragmented yeast genome and they ligate this into a vector. So um, a random piece is ligated and, and we don't they don't know and we don't know what piece of DNA gets ligated into the vector. And we tra make, um, transform the vector into E. coli, the E. coli, then purify the plasmid back out and sequence um, the insert to find, um, to find out what was cloned. Uh, we use the sequence information at the yeastgenome.org site. So this also introduces students to model organism and a website designed um, around the model organism and um, and a chance to kind of explore um, how all of the information about yeast is is organized and shared in the yeast research community. They use the analyze tool at this site to access last so that the only results they get are other are yeast sequences and then um, they can choose uh, they are usually they're because of the density of yeast genome, they almost always have sequenced part of a gene, at least. And then they can look up the gene name from, that they get from the blast search and learn about the gene's um, function in yeast. So um, also all at that site. OK, so um, that was the, 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 the end of um, the introductory sequence part of my, and I'm not going to move into the upper level courses and um, the ways that we use bioinformatics tools. And um, the course I teach is enzyme analysis. So I'm going to stay with that same sequence, structure, function, theme that I've been talking about today. Um, but we do have a couple other courses in our curriculum that use bioinformatics in a way that's a little bit more directly bioinformatics. So I'll, I'll just have a slide of that at the end too. For uh, my course, um, I'm using a mutational analysis study to study the structure and function of an enzyme. I have 16 students in this in this course and we meet for eight hours a week. So um, two lab sessions and then a weekly journal. We um, purify and, um, and then study the activity of uh, protein. So that's what this picture is showing the growth. And again, I'm, I'm using E. coli. So we're, I'm showing E. coli growth and then pelleting the cells and getting ready for a protein purification. The goals of this course are to provide an independent research experience within the course. So they do have the, the structure of a course setting, but the um, goal is that they're mimicking a scientist in everything that they're doing so that every um, even though it's guided and structured, that when they write something, when they write a report, it's structured like a journal article. Um, we have data meetings, we have journal clubs. The students have are directed at the beginning of the course with um, how to do experiments, but then they're left on their own to do their research a little bit more um, um, in as the as the course progresses to the end of the semester. We use bioinformatics and computational tools to understand the protein structure and function and to make predictions and guide our, our, um, our analysis. The enzyme that we use in this course is methionine synthase, or METH. It is an enzyme that has two active sites, which is helpful for these projects so that it, it broadens our type of projects that we have available. So some students study this part of the reaction, and some students study this part. So in the course structure, we have the first um, six weeks are all learning about the wild type enzyme. So we do a little bit more um, journal club and reading at the beginning of the course. It's it's more heavy towards that reading and trying to learn about what's already been done with this enzyme. And then the end of the course is more independent where students are doing more of their own research. So they're learning the wild type enzyme assay. They're um, studying a sequence alignment. Again, they construct their own multiple sequence alignment and try to find the regions of conservation in that alignment. They study the structure of the wild type protein and, um, 
and then generate some structures of mutant proteins using fire, uh, and then try to make a proposal for an enzyme that they were, and I'm sorry, a particular amino acid that they want to study. Then in weeks seven through 10, they construct the mutant plasmid and um, check for protein expression, purify protein, and then in the last part of the course, they're analyzing the data and I'm trying to perform kinetics assays for the mutant protein. So in these pictures, this is looking using pymol with a surface view of the active site, and this is the substrate. Um, this is an arginine here up in blue that has um, two predicted hydrogen bonds with a carbonyl group here. And then in this picture, that arginine has been mutated using um, fire um, to create a mutant PDB file of the protein using homology searches. And um, this is just a measurement. There's not a hydrogen bond here. And then students so, um, sequence their, when they make the mutation, they sequence the plasmid and um, confirm that the mutation is there. And then here's an SDS page that shows a protein being expressed at the right level, and then an activity assay that shows a big decrease because of the mutation. Um, this is an example of a sequence alignment that students start out their projects with. We, um, I help them choose sequences that are divergent so that we can study more, um, get more information about what's conserved and helps us with that idea that what's conserved is important to the enzyme structure or function. Or function. And then they look at some of these conserved sites and a proposal for an amino acid to mutate and study. In this course, we talk more about the background bioinformatics a little bit. So we, I do talk about, um, I present this BLOSSOM 62 matrix to help them understand the, um, the way the um, cluster omega and BLAST are searching for homology and the way that the programs can score an identical amino acid paired with an amino acid substitution that might be chemically similar, even if it's not the exact same amino acid, it still gets a positive score. Where um, um, uh, different amino acid substitutions would get a negative score. So we talk a little bit more about the scoring that goes on and the algorithm that's involved, um, at least the initial design of an algorithm that was involved for um, using those types of search programs. We also talk about the background experiments for protein crystallography and, um, and study protein um, crystal structure papers, and then students use that information to, um, to combine and choose an amino acid that they're interested in. For all of the computational methods in this course, we read um, an article together as part of our journal club. And then, um, as, and so when we use FIRE uh, homology modeling program, we read the article together and discuss uh, what kinds of input um, that we need for the study and, and then how what we do with the results when we get them back and how we um, make judgments on, on how trusty the results are, and those kinds of things. So we have more of those kinds of discussions in this upper level class that we don't have in the intro course. This is an example of the um, one student study um, using PyMol and the model that they made to look at um, an, amino, an amino acid asparagine 564, its interaction with the substrate, and how that would change, how they predicted it would change. And then this is looking at the fire structure of mutant um, protein and how that, that orientation might, might um, move a little bit. And then we're planning to um, go forward with this using a couple um, additional computational um, studies that are new for this course this semester since we're more online. We're going to be using a Swiss doc to dock uh, mo molecules um, or dock uh, ligands in our PDB structures. We're going to use H plus to calculate pKa values for the amino acid side chains. 
um, in the structure and how those may change because of different mutations that they've made. And then um, a couple of the projects that students have chosen to do this semester re require protein-protein interactions. And so we're going to be using HawkDoc to make models of those protein-protein interactions. So those are still upcoming. We haven't done those yet. Um, okay, the poster session that we um, end the semester with every semester, the students um, put everything together that they've been working on in a poster and then present to each other on the last day. So they do both a final lab report and a poster presentation for their the end of their project. The, um, this uh, curriculum has been assessed using the CURE-SURE survey. So this was developed by David Lopato at Grinnell College, and he's worked a lot with um, my colleague Sarah Elgin and the bioinformatics course that she teaches, in, um, and it's, it's more of a genetics course. And, he, and, and then I've also um, used the same survey to assess the course that I just told you about, enzyme analysis. Um, some references for how he developed the survey. And basically what he's asking with the survey is how well the course experience aligns with an independent research experience. And this is all self-reporting with students' attitudes and, um, and how they're reflecting on the course elements and the learning gains for, um, for their, their CURE experience. And then he compares similar survey results um, some are undergraduate research experiences, and so that we can see how well our students are feel about their research experience, if they feel like they had an independent research experience. So the next two pictures I'm not going to spend very much time on, because I know you probably can't read all of these uh, little um, the, um, sentences on the x-axis, but in blue and red uh, are the way my students have responded to these questions. Um, this is a Likert scale from one to five on how well they agree with different um, elements of the course. So, um, for example, one says collect data. Um, students agree that they collected data, for example. Um, computer modeling, they agree they did some computer modeling. Um, down here, taking tests in class, we did not take any tests in class, so that was very low scoring, which is good. Um, and then um, work as a whole class, we didn't work as a whole class. Um, very much, we were more in small groups, and so that got a higher uh, rating. So here's they're they're just reflecting on what was part of the course and what wasn't. Um, so um, working on projects that no one knows the outcome. That one was important to me that they felt like that because that is true. They were making mutations that people hadn't made before, and they did score that highly. And then um, in green it are the responses of all students who have taken. Uh, a cure and done this survey um, for a one-year period. And um, this graph um, um, it compares students in my course with students who have done summer research. So they would be in blue here. Um, and then these are all students that have taken the survey. So um, just kind of chosen in many categories, they they scored the court, they felt like they had um, some an independent research experience. Um, it, my lowest scoring ones were about um, ethical content, content, which we didn't, I didn't talk a lot about ethics. Um, I should have, I'm sure. Um, it looks, I, it scored low in clarification of a career path. All of the students in my courses are, have already decided what they're going to do, I think, by their senior year. And so they were either already interviewing for medical school or had already decided on graduate school, but mostly medical school. Most of the students um, are planning on. Um, okay, so I can talk more about that analysis if you're interested. I um, would love to hear any questions that you have, but I wanted to acknowledge all the students in the courses that really helped shape and assess this curriculum over the years. Kathy Hafer and Will Cruz were the ones that um, constructed the 16S ribosomal RNA experiment and yeast cloning experiment. So I wanted to make sure I credited that. Uh, David Heisey and Francis Stewart are our computer support for the biology department, so they've helped a lot with all of the computer components of um, all, all of the courses I talked about. Um, the 3055 curriculum was developed with um, Sarah Elgin, John Arus, and Hamadri Prakasi. 
and um, Sarah Elgin at the time had a grant from HHMI, and I was a curriculum specialist on that grant. So wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but before before I completely stop, oh, I do have a, a reference slide if anyone's interested in some of those references with um, David Lapato and. But before I completely stop and get, answer questions, I did want to mention that there are some other more bioinformatics courses that might um, be more familiar or that you might be interested in with this seminar series within our Department of Biology. So I talked about my enzyme course, but um, in that same category of curriculum, we have a new faculty member, Dr. Michael Landis, who this semester is teaching for the first time a course called Practical Bioinformatics working with large data sets. And he's he's completely online this semester, and I know he has a pretty small course um, trying this out for the first time. And then um, Dr. Chris Schaefer and Dr. Jeremy Bueller, they um, teach research explorations in genomics, which was started by Sally Elgin. And the, in this course, students work with original data sets that were um, obtained from the Genome Sequencing Center here in St. Louis at WashU. And they, it's all based on the fourth chromosome of Drosophila, the, called the dot chromosome, because it's, it's relatively small. And they get, um, they do finishing for that sequence um, in the course. And then they, as at half the semester, and then half the semester is annotate, annotating a section of the genome. And so it's a species of Drosophila that hasn't been studied before. They're, they're always working with something new that um, has a sequence that hasn't been obtained before and analyzed. So that is also still going on. They teach this in the spring. So I know um, Dr. Schaefer is getting ready to, to, um, to start that course up this coming spring again. And this is um, a partnership among multiple institutions that is still ongoing. Um, Alden has retired, but um, Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Bueller are keeping this going along with um, Wilson, who is who's really the the um, support of this of the whole program. So you can read if you're interested about that, you can read more about that at their website. Um, okay, I will, I'll finish now and, and take any questions. Oh, April, thank you so much. Uh, I'm curious to know. Um, of the courses you were uh, talking about, uh, it sounded like the, the first one, the Bio 2960, is that a required course? Yes, the introductory sequence is all required. So, yeah, 2960 is required. Yeah, what about the other courses? Are, are they electives or, or are they uh, required for the biology majors or for a particular biology track? Students are required to take an upper level lab class. So all of those cures are part of that category, so students have to take one of them, but they don't have to take mine. And, and I'm curious, for the ones that the students can elect to take, what have you found has been the reception among the biology uh, student population? Is, are those really popular electives, or do you find that you really have to work hard to uh, recruit students or to get them interested in, in taking that uh, in taking those courses? Um, students love the upper level classes, so those labs, those that all of them have gotten, there's, I think we have a total of 14 choices right now, um, because they're all so small and we have a pretty um, big major, uh, they, they're, they're all in demand, so we, we have wait lists usually. So juniors try to take them and sometimes they can get in and then um, but, but it's mostly seniors, I guess. Yeah. We don't have enough room to to let every junior take a class, take take a lab class, and they would like to take multiple. There are definitely students that would prefer to do all wet lab um, and not computer lab, but but we have a lot of students that also want, that really want that um, bioinformatics background. So. Well, that's interesting. I guess that's what I was really interested in is is do uh, do the undergraduates uh, pursue bioinformatics? Do they get that taste of that's important, or or do a lot of students say no, no, I'm going to med school. I, I don't really need this. 
I would say I would say both are true, but over the I know that when uh, we first started teaching that research exploration in genomics course, this when Sally Elgin and Chris Schaefer that I mentioned, that they recruited students from the computer science department when they first started that. And they um, put flyers up everywhere and they interviewed all the students ahead of time. So they handpicked the students that went into that class. So um, still the class had a reputation. There's definitely a lot of talking among um, students and they um, pass things along to the um, different um, classes. And so once there was a following, they haven't had trouble getting students. But the first couple of years, they did some active recruiting. And I, I'm curious, uh, you, you mentioned that the uh, that the uh, in some of the courses, it was the integration and synthesis and presenting of the materials that students found very uh, challenging. I was curious, uh, what other parts of the course did you notice students having the most uh, difficulty? Um, the in in the inter, in the 2960 course right or just even over the courses in general what, were there any particular areas that you noticed that students found the most uh seemed to have the most challenges or or, or seemed to struggle with i think anytime they're learning a new program if they have to uh, uh, even just from the user point of view it takes um it, they can get frustrated so I, I generally start them out with something that is pretty step by step, um, and and then and then I only give them that set of directions once, and then the next time they come back, I don't give them any directions. So they struggle a little bit more at that point. Uh, and um, but but if they don't have that step, then they don't ever really learn it. So if we only do the step by step point and click things, they aren't really learning how to use the program. So that struggle part is really important. And um, and I just have that. If, so for my upper level lab, I I know I know that they're going to struggle with that and just and then um, and and then I also build in the presentation again. So I tell them that they have to use PyMole to make their figures. That they're going to use for a presentation, and that's what encourages them to spend the time to 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 learn it well enough to get get a figure that they're happy with to show their to show in the presentation. So having having that telling part does seem to be a big motivator. And then I'm just interested from the instructor's point of view, uh, what parts of the course did you find like maybe most challenging to to teach? So you know, there's a parts of what students find most challenging to learn, but I'm curious to know from the flip side as an instructor, are there any particular parts of those courses that you think are particularly challenging to, to teach? Um, I feel nervous um, talking about the bioinformatics, uh, how to analyze the um, statistical outputs that they get from different bioinformatics programs. And so I, I, because I'm not in bioinformatics, so I guess I've dealt with that a couple ways. I sometimes I have a guest speaker come and um, and 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 lecture on that if I can, but I usually can't do that every semester. Um, but that that's a good stepping stone for helping me learn uh, and how and to answer student questions. And then um, the going to the articles and and just being open with the students that I'm learning along with them with the journal articles that we do. So like the computational programs that I'm using this semester that are new to me, I am being open with the students about that. And we're reading the articles together. And different students have different expertise based on their background. Some students have worked in research labs and can come in and and um, and, and help with different questions too. And so I, um, I guess that's how I've dealt with it. Just letting them know that I'm learning along with them for some of those topics. 